do my um, typical, what I say, a rolling start. So if anybody comes late, then they can, um, they can join in. Um, before I start, uh, I want to say it's good to see everybody and hope everyone is doing well, given um, the circumstance and everything that's going on in the world. Um, and kind of as usual, we start these um, Thursday evening classes. Um, I usually just open it up if there's any questions or um, thoughts that came up since the last week's talk or um, things you have on mind and wanted to share, uh, anything like that. So I just wanna be able to open it up and give people opportunity to ask questions. Seeing none, I will um, just mention that this, some of you know the history of this class and others don't. So um, I thought it'd be good to kind of give the history and why we have this format. And um, strangely, it's lending itself well to online. So <laughs> I think after all of this is over, uh, we will continue. We are talking about getting internet installed at the temple so we can actually live stream um, we may use Zoom or something else, but I think we'll be able to have more uh, real-time connection to um, events there, so that'll be good. Um, part of the hurdle to that actually is our building is 130 years old. Yeah, so there's not enough electrical outlets where you need them. <laughs> so we've actually had the problem of we can't turn uh, plug a camera in uh, or um, the fire marshal had a very uh, dis disapproving gaze at uh, power strip plugged into extension cord plugged into power strip. Apparently you're not supposed to do that. So we're trying to rectify that situation. Um, while everyone is out of the temple, is a good time to have the electrician come in and work. So uh, it'll be easier to do this kind of format from that space rather than only doing it at home. So. Um, so those are some updates. This class started, um, let me see, in 2011. So we're going on nine years approximately. Um, and it started when um, I was stationed in Hawaii at the, one of the Shingon temples there. Uh, and I was taking over for <clears throat> one of the senseis who had, um, had a, a pretty serious medical condition. And, um, during that time, a lot of the events were disrupted. So to get people coming back, um, I started this, uh, this class. And then when I came back to the mainland, um, we continued. So then it became um, this format, sort of uh, a little bit less formal, more questions. Um, but the purpose initially was um, I wanted to, I had heard from a lot of people who had come to the temple their whole life and they were unsure of some of the reasons why we did things at the temple. So I actually still have the notes from that. Um, so the first, the first 20 classes were just going through the service and going through all the meanings of the different aspects of the service, the mantras, why we do what we do, uh, why it's in that order it's in. And um, that, that actually proved to be very popular. <laughs> So it started off, I think, with um, simpler topics in a way, but there was always some deeper philosophy behind them. So it's grown, um, but I do try to keep it focused on um, as best I can. If you drop in for one, hopefully you get something out of it. If you keep going for years, it's a building on knowledge and that kind of thing. So at this point, we've moved on to covering texts and going through those. So um, I must say now it requires more work. So I do a lot more uh, background preparation than the old days. But um, it's been really interesting and, and rewarding for me. So um, the, the primary purpose from the beginning was um, to answer known questions and unknown questions. 
Oh, I sound like Donald Rumsfeld. The known knowns and the unknown knowns. Um, but I think a lot of times things come up as we go through. And part of what we're going to talk about today are um, why we practice, um, why we do the practices we that we do, and what's the goal for practice. So, um, as always, some parts of the text are terse, but um, I think hopefully if we keep it connected to some of the ideas we've been talking about in, in practice and, um, you know, how to be a, a better Buddhist, I think we'll be in good shape. So I don't expect you to memorize all this, um, but one of my goals was, you know, maybe um, if somebody asks you tomorrow at the office, you know, what did you... What did you learn? Maybe you could have one or two, um, you know, oh, we talked about this, we talked about that kind of response because I think that helps people orient themselves in their practice. Um, I think as Western Buddhists, sometimes we don't, we kind of turn away from devotional practice. So when difficulties come up in life, um, our practice falls apart because we're too in our head about it. Um, or we're doing practices in kind of an escapism perspective. So I'm going to sit on the cushion and, and relax and get away from it all. So um, rather than that perspective, maybe we have a little bit more insight and a little bit more uh, understanding of what's, what's behind us. So um, as I mentioned before, I have a, a sizable bookshelf over there. I can't, I don't actually have enough book, uh, shelves for all the books. <laughs> so there's a, a considerable amount of information uh, in the Buddha's teaching. Um, so I think it's worth studying. And um, even if we don't memorize it or, you know, feel like we, we want to give a talk about it ourselves or, you know, we may not be ready to write a, a thesis or something. Um, I think we can all do a better job of um, just going through these texts, reading through them, getting comfortable with the top type of topics. So I think all of that's a benefit. Um, if you are um, Christian, then some of things that you say become sort of formulaic and there's a benefit to that. So if you, um, I used to ask, you know, what are the magic words that make you a Christian? And some people would stare at me and then some people who weren't even Christian would say, oh, you, don't you have to accept Jesus as your savior? Uh, I say, yeah, those are the magic words, right? Um, so I would often ask the same question, what are the magic words that make you Buddhist? And no one could answer. <laughs> and so taking refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha are sort of the magic words that make you a Buddhist. But it's always important to remind ourselves what refuge means. And um, this is a good time when we have a major crisis, people are feeling anxious, uh, things are imbalanced in their lives to reflect on that. And um, I have a lot of, I have a lot of neat things behind me. Right? You don't need neat things to practice. Um, and this part of the text we're, going to look into um, talks about that. So what kind of perspective should we have when we do practice? What kind of perspective should we have when we um, pick up a text like the awakening of faith? Um, you know, what, what kind of faith are we awakening? There's a lot of questions we can ask back to the text. So I think when we keep those ideas in mind, if we engage with this, if we wrestle around with it a little bit, our practices deepen. So um, from that perspective, I think it's important. I think it's important to um, go through this and, and get those ideas. Um, oh, I'll see. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on who's muted if there's background noise and that kind of thing. Um, and then if you want to answer a question, unmute yourself and then we'll go back. So, um, 
again, technology. So if there's any time you can't hear me, if I need to speak up, please let me know. I, I'm not sure how it comes through on that side. So um, uh, just just let me know if video freezes or something and, and you want me to repeat, I'm happy to do that. So Okay, so we are, um, I think in the PDF, I don't have it up because I have the text, but I think it's still around page 26. So it's, um, we're gonna pick up at section C, the relationships between enlightenment and non-enlightenment. Um, this is, if we wrote this today, there'd be a lot different ways we could phrase this section and um, present the information. So do keep in mind, we are reading a you know fourth century classic. So there's gonna be, um, some obstacles, but I think this section actually gives us some really elegant and beautiful uh, verses that um, we can work with. So I will read you uh, those verses and then you can read along if you have the text with you. So it says, um, two relationships exist between the enlightened and non-enlightened states. They are identity and non-identity. So the first one, identity. Just as pieces of various kinds of pottery are the same nature in that they are made of clay. So the various magic-like manifestations, the Sanskrit Maya, of both enlightenment, anasvara, non-defilement, and non-enlightenment, avidya, are aspects of the same essence, suchness. For this reason, it is said in the sutra that all sentient beings intrinsically abide in eternity and are entered into nirvana. The state of non-enlightenment is, is not something that is to be acquired by practice or to be created. In the end, it is unobtainable, for it is given from the beginning. Um, so I'm gonna pause there, there's a quote, and I, I like footnotes, so I actually looked up the footnote, and it's uh, footnote 49, and then I gave myself a good chuckle, because the footnote is the author saying, they could not find this quote anywhere. <laughs> so, <laughs> Asagosha, uh, quotes from a sutra and um, they're not quite sure where that that quote came from um, so I, I thought that was thought that was good and honest and I got I, I enjoyed that <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a footnotes kind of person especially when the footnotes say we're not sure what we're footnoting so um, so it goes on also it has no corporeal aspect that can be perceived as such any corporeal aspects, such as the marks of the Buddha, that are visible are magic-like products of such as manifested in accordance with the mentality of human beings and defilement. It is not, however, that these corporeal aspects, which result from the super-rational functions of wisdom, are of the nature of non-emptiness, meaning substantial. For wisdom has no aspect that can be perceived. Okay. Um, once again, we get a bunch of words that you don't normally use in day-to-day um, -day speech, like corporeal or non-corporeal, um, and suchness. And I don't think I've even used manifested today um, in non-formal writing. So um, we'll try to pick this apart. So there's a couple of things that are used here <clears throat> um, that are worth sketching out what the Sanskrit refers to. So the beginning of that, it says, <clears throat> so the various ma magic-like manifestations, Maya. Um, <clears throat> that term, uh, Maya in Sanskrit, has the, um, meaning of like magic, but an illusion, but more of like an illusionist. So if you are, um, tricked by the illusionist. So if David Blaine comes in and he does his phenomenal sleight of hand and you have that mind blown moment, this is the kind of um, uh, idea it's talking about. So you, you see the sleight of hand that is so good, you assume it, it really is magic, kind of like casting a spell, wizard hat magic, um, that this really has happened. So it's pointing out that um, 
the way we view our reality, our so-called reality. We take the illusions to be actually real. We've sort of um, convinced ourselves that what we're seeing and the way we see it is actually the way things are. And this is a sort of a constant refrain in Buddhist uh, teachings that we're filtering things through a lens and a level of understanding that's not um, actual. So I'll give you um, an example. Um, if you view modern art, um, some people will view modern art and really go deep into the interpretation. What was the artist's background? What were they trying to convey? Um, and, and be very captivated by it. Other people um, will sometimes, if I'm at the museum, just shake their head and walk by. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> How is this art? And they go for the, the classical or the antiquities. Um, probably with all art, but I think especially with modern art, it really helps to know where the artist is coming from. You know, it helps to know their background. It really helps to know um, their body of work. And it helps to know kind of what's going on in society when they made that art. Um, that's less true of, let's say, you know, the Impressionist masters or Renoir or something. You can appreciate um, a painting of flowers. You can appreciate uh, windmills just for its artistic impression. And it, that painting can take you somewhere. If you learn more about the artist later, so much the better. But you can appreciate, um, you know, stepping up to the painting and seeing it. So um, it happens less now, but if you consider like a, an artist like Maplethorpe or someone um, whose art was um, caused a stir, I sh I'll say, <laughs> to, to say the least. Um, part of what's going on in the art is what you see. And there's another whole aspect of the art that has a lot to do with going on inside you. What is being triggered if you react one way or the other? So there's a whole other level of analysis that's going on. The art is just the art. <laughs> Our reactions and the various reactions that we see from people have a lot to do with society, how people are raised, what kind of assumptions we have from the beginning. And, our, um, and the reason I choose art is it's a good opportunity for us to evaluate um, our lens, right? What, what perspective do we have on the world that we bring to this art? Um, you know, a, a painting of a bowl of fruit doesn't um, evoke the same public debate, threats of violence, and uh, calls from the mayor to shut down a museum as a religious icon in bodily fluids. So why is that? So if we, um, we have to really consider that lens. So that's one way to look at um, what Asagosha is talking about here when he says, um, when he's talking about this illusion or how we look at the world and it's almost a magic-like quality. Um, so I think if we keep that in mind, so sometimes it's even hard for us reading the text to say, well, when am I so deluded? When, when do I see things as, as such an illusion? Um, at the very least, when we see the public debate about them, we can understand that there are definitely people seeing uh, two sides of something from a completely different perspective. Um, a few years ago, a good example in our country would have been um, you know, Confederate monuments. We have people who had very different views on their place in American society. Um, and you could probably easily spec out three, three different views, you know, one, maybe four, um, legitimate. And there's probably a, a lot of granularity in there, but you probably saw some that said, you know, this is just oppressive and racist. And other people say it's our Southern heritage. Others who say, yeah, it's racist because I, we want it to be racist. <laughs> and others that say, you know, there's a, there's a historical value and removing it takes away 
you know, the historical narrative and are we just erasing history? I think, you know, there's a debate to be had, but you have very distinct views of the same thing. So how can that be if, if there's only one reality? So um, this is the first step um, in a lot of Buddhist philosophy is keying us in that we, um, even things that we think everyone agrees on, even things that we think, well, that's not provocative or has nothing to do with our political ideas or you know, our social background or anything. Um, there's still this aspect of an illusion. So um, this language is used often uh, in describing uh, Buddhist ideas. So there is another term there, the uh, anasvara, um, which is referring to pure consciousness. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later. And I, if you're interested, I'll, if you want to do extra curricular reading, <laughs> homework, totally optional homework. Um, I'll, I'll share a link to an article on uh, Yogacara Buddhism. Um, but this starts getting into the different levels of consciousness that are postulated in, um, in, in within Buddhism and um, where our mistaken views come from versus where does the enlightened mind reside. So um, we are in a uh, school of Buddhism and most of the Mahayana postulates this Tathagatagarbha that we are originally enlightened and it's just a matter of uncovering that original nature. So where is it? Where is it hiding? Where is it when we're not enlightened if we have it already? So this is what um, the text is sort of feeding us these clues in advance that this is what it wants to talk about. And there's another term there, it says in the first uh, sentence, um, so the various magic-like manifestations of both enlightenment and non-enlightenment, so avidya. <clears throat> so the avidya is literally um, a lack of wisdom or a lack of insight, it's absence. So the Sanskrit ah is sort of like the uh, English un, so uncreated or unknown, that that prefix or non, you know, in, um, uh, so whenever we see that in English, it has a similar type of meaning. Um, and it's being discussed in terms of a lack of knowledge or, or awareness. So sometimes that's translated as ignorance. I find ignorance kind of hard when you read it in reference to Buddhist texts. So um, a lack of knowledge or lack of awareness. Um, the absence of that quality is what we're talking about. Um, and as happens with these texts, this is salting us with um, the expectation that probably Asvagosha had, that if you're reading his text, it's this text is there to answer questions that came up through long philosophical study. So he's pointing these things out so these are big terms. So we'll say something like thermodynamics and then the professor would turn, you, you all know the laws of thermodynamics. I don't need to go into that. And we keep going. Um, so he's all say, yes, yes, yes. We're, we're engineering students. We, we understand, move on. We're all with you. So when he throws out this avidya, he's sort of, uh, you know, salting the lecture with um, the knowledge. So I'm not going to assume that everyone's going, yeah, 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 yeah. I know exactly what, what he's expecting us to know right now. So instead, I'm going to tell you. Um, <laughs> so what he's hinting at is um, quality of mind um, of where avidya arises from. So how is it that we get to this point of not having wisdom or his absence? And um, of course, Buddhism, gives us a list. So there's a lot of lists of terms, <laughs> very common. Um, and here there's a list of, of 10. So there's 10, we could say 10 tendencies, 10 afflictions, 10 bad habits. Ooh, that's a good one. 10 bad habits that lend 
themselves or create this state of ignorance or avidya, this lack of awareness. Um, and if we look at those 10, it, we can learn a lot. So um, this ends up being really helpful for a couple reasons. One, it's sort of like diagnosing yourself. So you can say like, oh, have I ever experienced that? What I found and the way I like to think of it is some of these are so subtle that if they're not pointed out, you don't really notice them. Um, and it's like that for a lot of things. If you, um, uh, you ever lay down on the floor or lay in the grass, lay out in your garden or you know in a park, um, by changing your perspective and getting low, you start to notice things. Um, I'm, I'm relatively tall, so when I get down there, um, <laughs> I see a new world. So you see small ants and they're going about their lives and you start to realize like, oh, there's this whole other world happening just by me changing my position, slowing down, um, or uh, you know, taking a moment to be more still. So I like to think of, you know, whenever I come to these lists, um, I'm a bad Buddhist. I don't try to memorize all of them all the time. I try to take them from time to time and say, okay, I'm going to put them on my mental whiteboard. And when I do meditation, uh, try to keep them somewhat in mind. And at that point, uh, try to get a little bit more insight into them. So I found that they end up being very helpful from the perspective um, pointing out those nuances that aren't really obvious. So this is where I, I gain a, personally, I gain a, a deep respect for uh, the Buddhist teaching to have spent so much time teasing out all the detail. So there's a lot of detail. Um, so why are these things pointed out? Why are these negative tendencies pointed out? So here's, here's why. Um, we tend to indulge in certain types of thinking and we pat ourselves on the back for thinking that way. Um, and one of those is to reinforce uh, bad habits, naughty thinking, or sort of our, our self-righteousness. So if we have a negative impression of someone and we see something happen to them, we may think, you know, they deserve that though. You know, they had it coming. Um, that person's mean. Everybody knows they're mean. You know, what did they expect? So we, it's easy to slip into this sort of thinking. Um, and it might get to the point where we say, you know, I don't have an ounce of mercy for them. They get what they deserve. It's their comeuppance. So it's very easy to slip into that conversation. It may not be with regard to everyone or your neighbor, um, but there might be someone on the list that you're like, yeah, I, I don't mind that, you know, the FBI raided their house or something, you know? <laughs> um, so we may, we may fall into this, uh, this thought pattern. And what the text is telling us is if these kind of negative tendencies go unchecked, um, they're leading us further into delusion. They're leading us further into building up more similar thoughts. It's harder for us to, to generate positive thoughts. So um, if you look at these 10 and then you think of what's the inverse, that'll tell you what the practice is, right? So they're broken up into two sets of five. So the first one is view of self. So it's your identity view. It's the idea that um, you are a permanently existing entity that's unchanging. Um, and this one's, you know, sort of at the base of Buddhist philosophy, but, um, it's hard to break, right? This is the hardest one to break. And sometimes we, um, we pride ourselves on it. You know, I've been the same, I'm unwavering, I'm a lifelong fill in the blank. Um, and so we, we take that and we heap it on, we, we put that bumper sticker on our body and we, we get really prideful about it and we don't recognize how it might limit us. We don't recognize um, 
where it takes us. So um, the, the deep Buddhist philosophical aspect there is um, we don't recognize all of the different influences that come to bear that we conveniently put a name label on. But as a starting point, I think we, if we can be more flexible about all of our labels in general, we're making a lot of progress. So that's the first one, view of self. Um, and so then if you turn it around and you say, well, what's the antidote to view of self? What's the opposite? The opposite is no self, um, right? Starting to see your identity and um, your existence as a combination of factors and experiences that um, are all separate and at the same time interdependent. Um, I, I, uh, a friend of mine is looking at houses and they said to this house, oh, what do you think? Is it, is it situated right? You know, is it, does it have good feeling? I said, oh, it has really beautiful wallpaper. That's really nice wallpaper. And they're like, I hate the wallpaper, like really strong. I was like, oh. So then I had to think like, why do I like that wallpaper? So I had to think really hard like, oh, we had that wallpaper in my house when I was growing up and my parents liked that style of wallpaper. And I probably never thought about my own opinion of the wallpaper. I just subsumed this other identity and opinion about it. Um, and then I thought, oh, I'm actually indifferent to it. So sure. But I thought like, oh, why? Why would I like it and someone else have such a strong reaction about something that I would think so neutral as wallpaper? So um, that's that's one example. But I think if we we develop a little bit of insight into it, uh, it's helpful. So the first one, view of self. The second one is extreme view. So it's a view consisting of kind of going too far in one extreme. So the classic Buddhist example is um, either eternalism or nihilism, right? That there's only these, these two things. Um, we have this a lot, I think, as Americans, we think, well, it's either one or the other. It either is or isn't. You know, we have this black and white kind of viewpoint. And part of our obstacle, I think, in the West with um, this kind of mistaken view or extreme view problem is um, our language. So um, English, so why is English the universal language for business transactions? Anyone can guess? You can be very precise about what is or isn't, right? Um, my first job out of college was in international shipping. And I'll never forget because I came upon uh, the term indelible. And it was very clear that um, we had a, uh, uh, a letter of credit from a company out of, from, I think in Brazil. And we had to ship the goods in a specifically sized crate marked on all six sides in indelible green ink. And my boss at the time made it very clear if we were to deviate in any way, shape, or form from the letter of credit, all the terms specified, the company wouldn't get paid. So we had to drive all around town for two days trying to find a Sharpie marker that was green, that was indelible green ink. We couldn't use any other color. She was like, literally, if we, if we mark it in black, we're not going to get paid. So I'll never forget this indelible green ink. <laughs> but... Um, one of the reasons why uh, our language limits us is we, this level of precision that's present in English um, can limit our thoughts, can limit how broadly we think. We tend to think uh, sometimes in contract language. You know, a lot of times the questions we ask back to people are very, we're trying to go for like granular precision. So that's our tendency from language. Um, so that sometimes limits us to think, well, it's either this one thing or this other thing. We have a hard time sometimes thinking of all the things in between. So um, that's the, the typical extreme view. We're all the way to one side and we can't budge. And we see the other person as all the way to the other side. 
So um, this is the extreme, the extreme view idea. So what's the antidote? Um, the Buddhist path, the middle way, right? And so sometimes the middle is really hard to find. Um, we, we find that in, in, in politics, right? You have to cross the aisle to get things done, right? And people pride themselves on, um, you know, bipartisan solutions, but sometimes that's very difficult to do. It's hard sometimes to see the other person's perspective. Um, so that's one, we have to be careful. The third one is mistaken view. And mistaken view um, refers to our failure to see cause and effect in um, our decisions or our outlook. Um, so we're probably seeing this in um, our country right now with regard to coronavirus. Who's going to open? When are we going to open? What decisions or bases do we dec decide to reopen? Um, I think one state just had a, a court decision that said, you know, the governor can't make, um, can't, doesn't have the power to make these orders. And legally that may be true in that state's law, but does it take into consideration the effect of the order, right? So is that actually a good decision in terms of human health? Um, so those are our kind of real world examples, but in our own life, um, the mistaken view happens often. We sometimes see things one way and we don't see how things got there or we don't think what's the next step. So we don't aren't looking at things from the perspective of cause and effect. From a strict kind of Buddhist view, um, it's sort of denying the truth of cause and effect. So um, this is sort of a key philosophical idea, but um, I am trying to keep it um, how can we identify it in our, our daily life um, perspective? But um, the mistaken view, one of the reasons why um, it's dangerous is it can really undermine your religious practice, right? Your spiritual practice. So if you get into, let, let's take the court example. Um, you say, well, I'm going to read the letter of the law. Well, the outcome of that is potentially, you know, people becoming ill. Um, it's not necessarily a judge's decision to consider that, but if you're a all powerful ruler <laughs> and you don't consider all of the causes and effects, then um, you're saddled with a lot of, uh, lot of issues. So um, it can undermine your your ethical practice if it's such a rigid um focus if you're not thinking of you know everything through in more detail so the fourth one is a attachment to views so it's your literally your point of view <clears throat> um your um whenever they use this view of viewpoint the sanskrit word is uh Drishti, and the drishti literally refers to your gaze, so like you're viewing a, a scene. So it's sometimes helpful um, to see that, that we can actually be, there's sort of a visual that goes along with this. We can be very uh, attached to one of these views. And um, it's referring to the error of taking our opinion or theory to be correct. And it sort of very rigidly apply um, our own opinion, not being open to other points of view, other perspectives. Um, that's that I think we've all experienced. Um, we've all at some point been determined, like, oh, I'm absolutely right. You know, I'm sure I left it right here. <laughs> and then we find, you know, we're wrong. Um, so being so rigid sometimes can be a, a tremendous obstacle. Um, where it becomes really uh, difficult for spiritual practice is, um, I think sometimes we have very specific views of what practice is. Um, I always point this out. So some of the people that are on the Zoom will know that uh, I say this often. 
Um, if you, the example I like to make is anyone going from a Western country Buddhist center traveling to Asia will wonder eventually why their practice looks nothing like the practice that they see typically being done at Buddhist temples in Asia. And much of the cause for that is um, a rigid sort of attachment to view. So early introducers of Buddhism to the West had an opinion about what Westerners could or couldn't do or what was best for them. Um, and they decided oftentimes in a vacuum to just chop out uh, large chunks of traditional practice and decided this won't be palatable to the Western mind. The Western mind is like this, right? That's a very rigid view of what the Western mind is. Um, and oftentimes that came from introducing Buddhism in um, very rigid academic um, circles. And so the questions they received from PhD philosophers were oftentimes assumed to be the questions they were going to get from the average person. So um, in that vacuum, a, a whole host of practices were just dumped. <laughs> or a particular practice was said, oh, we're going to make this the primary practice. Um, I was listening to a podcast. I think it was a podcast. It was been a few years ago. But it was a Zen teacher in America, and they had gone back to Japan. And uh, they were talking about the uh, temple they were touring, which was the kind of the beginning of their lineage. And the, the sensei at that temple was showing them a new statue that they had um, installed at the temple. And um, he was sort of describing his shock at watching this Japanese sensei bowing um, to the statue and then the offerings that were arranged and found it very unusual. Um, and I was thinking, what, how is, how is this possible? And then I realized how far diverged um, sometimes practice looks in Western countries and, and, and in the East. So um, I think without the comparison, one side can say, no, this is, this is what Buddhism is and not realizing that it's much broader, right? So this um, attachment to views can get us into, into a lot of trouble. And the fifth one, the first of the five, is um, attachment to precepts. And specifically here, it's attachment to uh, ritual or rites or the form of ritual. So um, the idea that if you are just sort of following along with the crowd, that that's enough or that's most important. Um, so there's a couple of reasons why this can get in trouble. Um, if you're following it without understanding it, um, and that may be the beginning, right? If you go into the monastery, it's like the military. You, you do it to stay out of trouble, but you should eventually develop uh, an understanding of the reason why you're doing it or why those things are important. Um, I, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that are done in boot camp, for example, that soldiers only learn the benefit of or the importance of later. Um, you know, marching, drills, getting up on a schedule. Um, they realize later, oh, we have to work as a unit. It's not my individual needs, it's the group's needs. That's how we achieve whatever our goal is. Um, Temple is the same, but the um, caution here was that if we don't ever develop an understanding of the reason why we just hold on so rigidly, that becomes an obstacle. So um, there are, um, in the in the Vinaya, um, there are rules for a lot of things. If you go back in the commentaries, there's also a reason why those rules or vows were created. And knowing the reason why is really important because um, as monks and nuns travel around the world, they had to make alterations and changes. So if you compare, um, you know, Buddhism in Sri Lanka 
to Buddhism in Taiwan, um, you'll see a, a big difference. And one of those differences is, you know, monks and nuns uh, having farms, raising their own vegetables, cooking, you know, a lot of things centered around the kitchen. Whereas in Sri Lanka, um, you won't find that. You'll find people bringing alms and, and passing out food to the monks. Why the difference? The difference is the emperor of China said, you're not going to wander around and beg for alms. Stay in the building. <laughs> so we all oh, guess we better cook and plant some vegetables. <laughs> so things have to change. Um, but if you hold so rigidly to uh, precepts or rules, then there's going to be a lack of, you know, your ability to, um, you know, make needed and healthy changes. So that's, we could say here it's uh, um, don't get trapped in form over function. The, the function is really important, right? Does it work? Not necessarily all the time as important as, um, you know, the format. So the next five are easier. So you read them off. I don't, I shouldn't have to say a whole lot of them about them. So they are desire, hatred, ignorance, pride, and doubt. So desire, hatred, ignorance, pride, and doubt. So these are considered um, obstacles for developing religious sensitivity. That if we um, are holding on very strongly to um, pride, doubt, these kinds of things, is going to be an obstacle for our own um, spiritual development. So I see there's a comment in the chat. Um, these are the um, kind of 10 negative tendencies or obstacles. And I'm, um, as I'm apt to do, it's an expansion of what uh, avidya means or what it's referring to or why it's coming up in the text here. So that answers. I'll try to keep a, an eye on the chat there too. Okay. So why does he drop those in? He's dropping those in so that when he mentions um, avidya, um, we kind of at least have an idea of what is meant by the term and why it shows up here. Not necessarily that, okay, stop reading this part of the awakening of faith and memorize the list, just so that we have that in mind a little bit. Um, so I wanna take a closer look at the little bit more cryptic part of that um, first part of the text. So it says, the state of enlightenment is not something that is to be acquired by practice or to be created. In the end, it is unobtainable. Also, it has no corporeal aspect that can be perceived. Any corporeal aspects that are visible are magic-like products in accordance with the defilements. So there's a, there's a unasked question, at least for me. So here's the question that I see, and then I'll try to answer it. The question that I would read is say, well, so is enlightenment mean this means enlightenment can, can't be obtained? It's because it says the state of enlightenment is not something that is acquired by practice or created. So why are you telling me to meditate? Why do I recite mantras? What's the point? If I can't obtain it or create it, um, it's not something acquired. It's not something you accumulate through practice. It's not like, oh, I, I really wore down my prayer beads. I'm going to get it you know, any minute, someone's going to come reward me. Um, it's not, if I do enough mantras, enough hours of meditation, you know, if, if this time, if my legs really fall asleep and I, I just ignore it and keep going, someone's going to, you know, say, oh, you stacked up enough good karma chips. Let's cash you out. Enlightenment is yours. Um, that's not, that's not the perspective. It's also true that it's not true. That's not a good way to say it. <laughs> so another question you could ask is say, so then is practice useless? Right. Remember, I told you there's a whole chapter in this book about practice. <laughs> so no, practice is not useless. Um, 
it's not that practice isn't getting you anything. It's that practice is for getting rid of things. Right? So the idea in Buddhist practice is you're not acquiring, you're not accumulating, you're not proving something to someone else. You're doing this to get rid of stuff. The mind state of enlightenment is already there. It's obscured by debris. It's obscured by inattention. It's hidden behind the fog of um, negative tendencies. Um, it's, it, we can't see it because we're so busy trying to prove to people we're right. All those things. So these are the things that get in the way of us seeing it. Um, so like in the example, and you will see me do this. So, you know, when you see me laying down on the ground, looking underneath the flowers and leaves, um, I actually haven't lost my mind, <laughs> but oftentimes when you change your perspective physically, you see things differently and it's been there the whole time. You just didn't notice. And what kept you from bending down? What kept you from changing that perspective or focus? What kept you from listening? Um, deeply to the other side's opinion, not listening for, let me listen for the weakness so I can attack them. But no, what, let me really try to understand, um, you know, the person that I think I have a strong disagreement with. So all of those things um, are saying that these are symptoms. And if we can recognize the symptoms, we can be more aware of these tendencies. So, um, there's symptoms for a kind of, kind of laziness. Um, we don't bother to observe the mind. We don't bother to give consideration to these factors. And because of that, um, we carry on thinking everything is okay. And the mind continues to carry us away down unexpected paths. And we're, we don't even know we're lost. We just think, oh, I'm out for a stroll. Right. Um, worst case, or in the worst case, we indulge in, you know, those negative mind states. We really dig deeper. Um, social media is a good example, I think. <laughs> you can see that. Um, the, the internet is a good example at times. <laughs> Both good and bad. Um, great learning resource. Uh, also corners of it are, um, I think much like the human mind where you go, wow, I didn't know people did that. And then I didn't know people did that to that degree and wow. And they're, they're really, you know, reinforcing certain things. So, um, I think this is hard for us as humans because we're used to amassing things. We're used to accumulating things. There's not a lot of conversation about ridding ourselves of things in society. Ridding yourself of things is not sold very much. Um, they'll sell you a storage unit so you can store more stuff, but we're not uh, programmed to reduce. Um, there's, I think, you know, a tendency right now for uh, minimalism, um, kind of clearing things out, but um, that's new. I think it's rare, and then sometimes I, I think it becomes its own thing to hold on to. That's the new thing to amass. Right? So if you have, this would be my stand-up comedy, if you have more than 10 books about downsizing or minimalizing, being a minimalist, you, you're not doing it right. <laughs> So I think that becomes a new um, consumerism. Minimalism becomes a new type of consumerism. So um, the key here is that the type of insight that Asa Ghosh is talking about isn't something you get from outside. It's something you discover is already inside. And the practice is helping you do that. So the symptoms are the list that we talked about. Okay. So that was identity. So we're in that small C, the relationship between enlightenment and non-enlightenment, 
And it says the two relationships exist between the enlightened and non-enlightenment. They are identity and non-identity. So that's the identity. The next one is non-identity. Um, so that one says, and it uses this very beautiful um, verse, I think, this example of pottery. Just as various pieces of pottery differ from each other, so differences exist between the state of enlightenment and that of non-enlightenment, and between the magic-like manifestations of suchness manifested in accordance with the mentality of human beings in defilement and those of people of ignorance who are defiled, for example, blinded, as to the essential nature of suchness. Um, I like this, this um, example of pottery. So just as the pieces of pottery differ from each other, so differences exist between the state of enlightenment. Um, this is a, an allusion back to the um, earlier example where he uses this uh, idea of pottery. He says, identity, just as pieces of various kinds of pottery of the same nature, uh, excuse me, are of the same nature and that they are made of clay, so the various like manifestations of both enlightenment and non-enlightenment are aspects of the same existence. So you can have um, two things made of the same substance that have radically different properties. Um, remember, it's I think helpful to remember this whole verse is about helping us answer the, the deep question that we all ask. How is it that Michael Jackson can be, or excuse me, Michael Jordan can be the best basketball player, right? How is he so much better than everyone else? He's human too, right? Why can he play better than anyone else? Um, why can one student appear to make progress faster than another? Uh, aren't we all in samsara? Aren't we all in the same boat? You know, why can, you know, why do we see this difference in um, understanding the Buddhist teaching in the sutras? Um, so I think this this clay example is 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 brilliant in this way. So um, take take the clay example. We'll we'll kind of move with that. So if you do pottery or seen pottery or own pottery, um, made of the same things, like largely, but different glazes are used. They're fired at different temperatures. They have different thicknesses. We don't normally ask. Um, why a teacup isn't as strong as bathroom tile. We just understand that that's the case. Um, we might wonder how is it that a ceramic knife can be so much sharper than a steel knife when it's all ceramic, right? So if you think about all the different things that are ceramic um, that you own or you're surrounded by, they have vastly different qualities. So the same is true for the human being. And this non-identity um, verse about the pottery is sort of our entry or introduction to the next section. So um, it's telling us we have different qualities. Those qualities are based on um, our, our various ways of being raised, our, our constructed identities. Um, you know, the kind of climate we came, grew up in, all manner of things. Um, and that's, that's sort of the key thing. So he's going to answer that question to some degree in the next section. So that next section to the causes and conditions of humankind's being in samsara starts out with a really long translator's note. So um, I'll read it and then I'll... If you want, I'll offer you a alternative reading. If you want, I'll give you the link. So translators note, a literal translation of this title is the cause and conditions of birth and death. The cause stands for the aspect of non-enlightenment in the storehouse consciousness, ignorance. The conditions stand for mind and consciousness in the state of non-enlightenment. In short, this section undertakes to deal with the mentality of a person who is unaware of the absolute order despite the fact that he is intrinsically in it. In the following argument, some similarity can be found between the author's thought and the doctrines of Yogacara school of Mahayana Buddhism. The Yogacara school advocates the concept of mind only, and his doctrine is known as subjective idealism. The author presents the subject in his own way, developing the concept of Tathagatagarbha, but some basic ideas and terms must be taken into his system from Yogacara sources. 
That's a lot of terms. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, at the time, Oxford Gosha, what, what the translators, Hakeda is warning us, we have the benefit um, sitting here in 2020 of reading about every school of Buddhism today. We can read things out of order historically. We can read about all the various and different schools of Mahayana Buddhism. And for us, that's going to cause confusion. It's rare. I, I don't see very many books that present a you know, particular lineage of Zen or present Shingon or all these different schools strictly from their philosophical arc. What happens for us is we end up reading from all these different sources and different philosophical terms, different ideas about the mind are presented differently. So I would really say read this translator's note as a, as a general caution that um, especially what's available to us in the West tends to be so scholarly and not meant for practitioners that it can cause confusion. So at the time Asvagosha wrote this as an Indian philosopher, um, the ideas of mind and what would become Yogacara were still being hotly debated. Um, by the time it coalesced as a independent school, um, all these things were happening around the same time. So the way he uses the terms aren't going to be exactly the way um, you read about Yogacara um, in a book, if you picked up a, a book on Yogacara philosophy. Um, that said, I will, if we have time, please remind me, I'll send you a link to a good article that's not too long, that sort of summarizes uh, the Yogacara school and um, might help parse this out. But before we do that, I wanna share a, uh, try to share my screen and I'll show you um, a diagram. I found um, a diagram I found that uh, shows the various levels or levels of consciousness. So that might help when um, we're talking about this next section. So I'm going to share the screen and then I'll read you the next section. And that might help. So can you see the diagram? Okay. So the first arc, I'll try to make this bigger. I don't know if that's... I don't know that helped or hurt. Um, the top arc, the sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, probably noticed this from the Heart Sutra. Um, so these are considered the first five levels of consciousness, how we bring knowledge in to the world. Um, then the six is this integrating of sensory data. So bringing everything in and then being able to understand that's a blue, soft, plush children's toy, right? That smells like cookies. You can bring it all together and then start to identify information in it. Sort of that, oh, that belongs to the child. Um, then the seventh there is the realm of the unconscious. And then the eighth is the alaya consciousness, the storehouse. So both the, um, where knowledge of past lives re resides, also um, subconscious tendencies, really, really deep subconscious tendencies, things that may come through over time. And then under that is the Buddha nature. So we, obviously I would say a good way to think of this is the layers um, are not the scale. We may have one of these that are um, incredibly deep. There may be sub layers to it, but it's very difficult to, for us to penetrate through because we spend most of our time in one through seven. Um, eight is, unexplored territory and there's a lot to explore and this is the reason why we don't see the much deeper 
um, the deeper layer. So that's what is talked about here in the next section. So that a person is in samsara results from the fact that his mind, manas, and consciousness, vijnaya, develop on the ground of the storehouse consciousness, that number eight. This means that because of the aspect of non-enlightenment of the storehouse consciousness, he is said to be in possession of ignorance and is thus bound to remain in samsara. So our day-to-day -day consciousness that we know of is built up from number eight, but we're kind of going in the wrong direction. We're not asking why is all this stuff here? We're saying, ooh, there's all these toys, let's play with them in new and unique ways. And because of that, um, we often continue the cycle. So if I can figure this out, I will share you that um, diagram. Mm. I'll probably cut and paste, right? Bear with me as I there you go. So it may be easier to view on your own screen rather than through the screen share. Um, so this is what this is is talking about. Sometimes it's helpful to have a diagram. I've seen better ones. I couldn't find um, a better one for this evening, but I, I stumbled upon that one. So. Um, so is, um, <clears throat> is Shingon Yogacara not exactly? We share a lot of, um, ideas about the structure and nature of mind and its, its use and organization within Buddhist philosophy. You'll find a lot of, um, similarities, but Shingon sort of proffers this theory of Sokushin Jobutsu, enlightenment in this very lifetime. So the idea that um, this is my personal, very overly simplified example. Um, if we say that there's the, the Alaya consciousness is your attic and garage that have been neglected cleaning out for a long time, um, and the traditional Buddhist view would be that you need to go through each thing, sort it all out and get rid of all of the junk before you can really see the open space again, um, which would be the emergence of the, the enlightened mind. Um, the Shingon's theory is that certain practices would be enable you to, um, break through much faster. So maybe you're able to deliver a Bruce Lee style sidekick that just throws all the junk out into the street in one fell swoop. Um, or you decide, I don't need any of it. And you just light the match <laughs> or, you know, it's, it's Portland. So you just say, you put up a sign that says free. And then within five minutes, it's all gone. You know, people come and grab everything. <laughs> um, so there, there may be a faster way. However, that, uh, those faster methods uh, come with uh, obstacles. So the other day we were cleaning the temple. Um, we came upon some items that we didn't need. We put them on the corner. Within five minutes, it was gone. Um, and then I went to drive away, and I, I recognized that the people who had taken those items had placed stuff underneath my tire. So I was in a, <laughs> for a rude awakening, is why, why is there a... <laughs> a mountain underneath the tire. <laughs> so um, sometimes when you use faster methods, you have to take, uh, you have to take care, right? You have to maybe uh, do some more looking around or uh, things like that. So uh, I'll pause there. So maybe we'll have a little bit of time for meditation.